Have your savings earned enough for you during the past six months? A good return on the full amount? At Industrial Federal Savings, you get higher earnings twice each year, plus insurance to $10,000. Make your money make more money for you safely at Industrial Federal Savings, 1630 Stout. Better to light one candle than to curse the darkness. <laughs> This is The Biggest Heart, a program for and about you, the people. A program to bring you the little-known stories of those who devote their lives to doing for others. Presented each week at this time by Fred Ward, Hudson Dealer and Distributor, and your neighborhood Hudson Dealer. Now here is Pete Smythe to tell you about tonight's person of The Big Heart. Thanks, Bill, and hello, everyone. Tonight, we're going to talk in terms of many big hearts. For tonight marks the end of this series of broadcasts. It has been 26 weeks, six months, since Fred Ward said, uh, uh, Pete, what do you suppose we try to do some good? Let's do a program about the good things people do instead of the bad things. The idea was that we hear and read so much of the pessimistic side these days. Why not try the optimistic approach? And so that's what we've tried to do. And we've been surprised at the results. We've learned a lot. There are many people, hundreds of them, who think constantly of the problems of others instead of their own, who give instead of get all the time. And when you do find them and get to know them, they stand out above the crowd like one of Colorado's numerous 14,000-foot peaks. You can see it in their faces. Invariably, they're happy people, and you can sense it in their being. I guess you'd call it character, for the dictionary says that character is a distinguishing quality. You may ask, as many do... But how do I do things for others? What do I do? Where do I go? Well, you could do as Mrs. Larry Archuleta did. She was the first subject of our first broadcast. And although she has eight children of her own, she finds time to look after other youngsters from broken homes, a blind lady just down the street. She gives parties for the kids. She does a lot... There's not much to do with. Sure, but uh, there aren't any kids in my neighborhood. And besides, they make me nervous. Well, then perhaps you like animals, as does Virginia Braswell, who cares for homeless dogs, horses, cats, mules, pigeons, uh, what have you. Now, she's a crusader for kindness. I'll never forget that one scene from the show we did about her last October. Brazzy, as everyone calls her, conducts children's writing classes. One day, as she and some of the children were on their way to her Arapahoe County ranch in her station wagon... Brazzy! Brazzy! Stop the car! Oh, Look! Right. Look! That horse over there! He's hurt! Oh, oh. Man. Gee, Walker! Someone has been mean to him! He's all bloody! Well, we'll just have a look at him. Look! He can only stand on three legs! Now, why would a poor old horse like this be tied in front of a tavern? in such terrible condition. He looks as though he's been dragged. You can see the bone of his leg, where they dragged him. Well, there's only one way to find out what happened. Come on, we'll go inside. Bartender, could you tell me who owns that horse out there? Yeah, that, that fellow right there. Would you please tell him I'd like to speak to him? Hello, lady. You want to see me about something? Yes, about your horse. The one tied out in front. Oh, him. He's on his way to the packing house. Gonna make dog food out of him. I'll bet he'd be plenty tough. To How much do you want for him? Oh, uh, he ain't no good, lady. He's crippled. How much? Well, the packing house will give me a set of pounds. I doubt if they will. He's so thin and he's lost so much blood. He might not even live till you get him there. I'll give you five dollars. Five dollars? Okay. Sold. Would you worry about getting them away from here? Huh? Bartender, could I borrow a piece of paper? We'll make out a bill of sale. Now, uh, uh, what's the horse's name? Name? Yeah, you, you got no name. Well, we'll name him. Lucky. Lucky? Why lucky, Brazzy? Well, it seems that this is his lucky day, and, and don't you think that he's lucky to be alive? Yeah, that's a good name. Lucky. I like that. Now, uh, sign this bill of sale. Thank you. 
Now, here's your five dollars. Thanks, lady. You're gonna call that horse Lucky, huh? Yes. Oh, well, you better call me Lucky, too, then. Here I am, I'm sitting there. A lady comes along and has me five bucks for a half dead horse. <laughs> How do you like it, huh? Step up, gents. Old Lucky's buying the drinks. <laughs> That's very interesting and wonderful. But you see, I'm not too well. I, I'm not supposed to do too much. Ah, that brings up the name of Max Rabinoff. Santa Rabinoff, as he was known. One day, he heard his doctor tell him that he must retire and just rest. But Santa had other plans. I rested and rested and rested. For two long years, I rested. And you know, that is very difficult for a man who has worked hard for many years to do. I like to work. I like to keep busy. And when we came to Lincoln Park and I saw all these hundreds of children who live here, I found the way. I started just by fixing their broken toys, replacing the lost bolts and screws and and general tinkering with their trikes and skates. Then I began to notice that many didn't have playthings. This made me very unhappy. And then one day, a wonderful idea came to me, a way to get toys for all. Are you Mr. Bixby? That's right, I'm Bixby. Are you the manager of the toy department? Yes, and the buyer. My name is Rabinoff, Max Rabinoff, and I have an idea. In your store here, you, you must have lots of toys that get broken in shipping or, or don't run for some reason, and you can't sell them? Well, yes, occasionally. Well, I'm pretty handy with tools, and, and I could fix them up and, and give them to the children who don't have many toys. Yes, I see. Say, that's, that's not a bad idea. If you could only see their smiles, you'd know how good it is. Yes, yes, uh, Mr. Um, Rabinoff. Yes, Mr. Rabinoff. We'll see what we can do. Are you Miss Rolfe? Yes. Oh, your shop is very beautiful, especially the dolls. Why, thank you. Miss Rolfe, you... Sometimes have broken dolls? Oh, yes. You'd be surprised what our breakage is. Well, I know several hundred little girls who who don't have nice dolls. Several hundred little girls? In, in my neighborhood, that is. Oh, I see. And if I could have your broken dolls, I, I could fix them up as good as new and, and make some little folks very happy. And not only that, Miss Rolfe. Yes? It will make you very happy, too. Mr. LaCrosse, have you ever seen the faces of poor children when you hand them a shiny toy? Miss Kent, you won't know these toys when I get through with them. If they can be fixed, I'll fix them. Mr. Marshall, if you could only see their smiles. Max Rabinoff became a year-round Santa Claus to hundreds of children at the Lincoln Park Housing Center. The kids called him Santa, and that's about as high a compliment as you can get from a youngster. He's no longer with us, but he left a light behind, one that is still burning brightly. And there was the singing Sam Egan story. Now, Sam has been crippled since birth. Gets about on crutches. Spends a good share of his time going around calling on shut-ins in their homes, in hospitals, and in institutions. Sam plays guitar and sings. Makes lots of folks happy. There's Lily Thomas, that wonderful colored lady. She works hard as a housekeeper every day, but she still finds time to visit the soldiers at Fitzsimmons 
and take them fine home-cooked food. Lily Thomas spreads this kind of philosophy every day. The emptiest kind of life is just living for yourself. Just go along day by day helping someone when you can. Helping someone is the way to be happy. Or you might try living by what H. Claire Welker of Loveland, Colorado has learned. Mr. Welker is a minister of Protestant faith. We saluted him last November 24th. He says, You know, I've learned three things. One, every person, rich or poor, has his problems. Two, you can't do any good for a fellow unless you know him. And three, you don't get acquainted with people by just sitting around the house. Sure, I know, all that philosophy stuff is okay. I read a lot of it, but these days there's so much going on. There's not enough hours in the day to do things. Well, Marion Brandeberry, our big heart of December 1st, could say that with reason of plenty. She has seven active small fry, oldest 12 years. Yet she and her pickup truck have carved quite a career for themselves, hauling lumber and coal, delivering monkey stoves and clothes and things. What somebody doesn't want, she sees that it gets to someone who does. Or do I make myself clear? Yes, but uh, you see... I... Or you could take James Rose Harvey. Now, there's a man who's always busier than a tax collector in March. Jim's specialty is looking after people who don't have enough to eat especially Indians. Hungry people worry, Jim, and he does something about it. Well, there's a way to solve most problems if you go at them from every angle. I found it necessary to work some angles, believe me. One night I came up with a wonderful one, and next morning I took it to the manager of one of the large grocery stores. Uh, you Mr. Sanderson? Yes. Well, my name is Harvey. Jim Harvey and I... Well, uh, we're just opening up and we're pretty busy. Besides, I see salesmen only on Mondays. Oh, uh, I don't want to sell you anything. Uh, I want to buy. Only I'd like to buy it for nothing. For nothing? Well, now, we, we can't operate a business on... Well, on that No, no, of... no, I don't mean that. Uh, uh, Mr. Sanderson, uh, what do you do with your merchandise that is left over at the end of a day? Well, we don't sell everything every day. We have lots left over. I mean the wilted lettuce and the stale bread and the fruit that may be bruised just a little. Oh, we sell some of it, and some of it just goes bad. Mr. Sanderson, I know a lot of people who would think it pretty wonderful if they could have some of these leftovers. Yeah, I suppose everyone does. But you see, it's a problem of getting it to the right people, the delivery problem. And supposing I delivered it. Well, do you know what you're letting yourself in for, taking all that stuff around? That doesn't bother me. It's getting the food that concerns me most of all. Well, we, we couldn't give it to you. We'd have to try to recover some of our loss. Believe me, there will be no loss. You'll be repaid in many ways uh, by the appreciation of grateful people who desperately need the food, by the... Yes, I suppose there are two ways of looking at profit and loss. Mm, you bet there are. You ever seen a group of six or seven human beings uh, sit around a table and make a complete meal out of two cans of pork and beans? Well, no. Then I... you've never seen their eyes. No, I don't suppose I have. Uh, try to look at it through their eyes. You'd find that... Pork and beans look like roast turkey or fried chicken. Uh, I didn't realize it was that bad. Well, most folks don't, don't, but it is. And right in our midst. Well, I, I guess we just don't have time to think about it much. Exactly. We don't have time. I read something the other day that has caused me to do a lot of thinking. Some fellow wrote, uh, I don't remember who it was, but he wrote, uh, It's time we took time, or else time is liable to take us. <laughs> So, Jim Harvey worked an angle. And that angle supplies food to ten different families, numbering altogether about 46 people. Now, there's an angle you might work. Sounds like a lot of trouble to me. Yes, I suppose it is. Let's see, how about Jean Kellogg, who has given hope where there was no hope? She's brought a new and exciting world to homebound, wheelchaired victims of cerebral palsy. No, I don't think I'd care for that kind of work. Well... That was George Roy, our big heart of January 5th. He's kept hundreds of kids out of mischief simply by getting them interested in music, by teaching them how to play a trombone or a drum, a saxophone, or a piccolo. I can't carry a tune in a basket. I see. That wouldn't do then, would it? How about Anna Sharp? We did her story on January 12th, and we couldn't begin to include all the wonderful things she's done for others. 
She's got the busiest phone in North Denver, and she never quite knows who she's going to find at the front door when the bell rings or what the problem is going to be. Miss, Mrs. Sharp? Oh, that's right. Can I talk to you? My name's Ruby Lawrence. The lady down the street sent me to you. I was working for you, and, and she said I was to come see you. Sure, honey, come in. Go right on in the living room. Sit down. Thank you. I'm afraid I... I don't know how to begin, Mrs. Sharp. I'm in awful trouble. Hmm. Yes, I think I understand. Sit down, Ruby. Now, you can tell me. He ran away from home? Yeah. How'd you know? Yeah, I ran away with this fellow. We were going to get married, he said, and... But you didn't get married, did you? No, and then he went off and left me. He was already married, you see, and I'm getting scared. The baby's going to come in just a little while, and what can I do? I can't work anymore. I haven't any money, and I... Well, maybe I'm silly, but you see, I want to keep the baby. No, honey, you're not silly. Is, um, is this man still in town? Yeah, but he just laughs at me. He says I can't prove anything. Oh, Mrs. Sharp, if you don't help me, I'm not going to try anymore. It'd be easier just to jump into a lake. Ruby, no more of that, you hear me? That's no answer to anything. Now you're going to have your baby. Yes, and you're going to be able to keep it, and somebody's going to pay for it. Ruby, I think we'd better go talk to a lawyer. But, Mrs. Sharp, ma'am, I told you, I haven't any money to pay a lawyer. Well, this lawyer's a friend of mine, Ruby. I don't think Bob Close will charge us anything for this job. Just wait right here. I'll go get my hat and coat and blow your nose, honey. Everything's going to be all right. <laughs> And Mrs. Sharp proceeds to make everything right. Her big heart is packed with understanding and her eyes sparkle with it. Gosh, it's too bad you don't like to work with youngsters. There's a big field there. At least Bill Mitchell has found that to be true. Now, he spends all his spare time working as a probation officer with a juvenile court. I'll never forget what he told me. A child must have made to feel that he is a part of the scheme of things. He needs a pat on the back, a word of encouragement. Now we know for sure that what happens to a boy depends on his home life. Let me tell you about Ralph Oliver, who was brought into court for petty theft. First, let's go back to the reason for his actions. How do you want your egg, Frank? Like I usually have it. How do you suppose? Well, I'm not a mind reader. You read everything else I have. Well... Look who's here. It's the king himself. Surely you're not going to get up now. It's only 8.30. I'm sorry, Mom. I didn't hear you call. Well, it's no wonder coming home when you did last night. You needn't think you fooled me. I heard you. Frank, do you know what time your son came home last night, or rather this morning? Sit down, Ralph. Frank, did you hear me? Yeah, uh, uh, what was it? If you'd keep your nose out of that newspaper for a minute, I'd tell you. I wish there weren't any newspapers. I said... Do you know what time Ralph came in last night? Oh, um, midnight? Midnight? It seems to be me that does all the lying awake and worrying around here. You'd sleep through the atom bomb. Midnight, midnight! It was two o'clock. Well, what do you want me to do about it? I've talked to him and he doesn't pay any attention. Mom, could I have an egg, please? If, if you'd pay more attention to him, maybe I could do something with him. You never correct him. You just leave everything up to me. You're too busy. Sure I'm busy. What do you expect? Money grows out of the lawn these days. I gotta make a living and I gotta pay the bills and I gotta keep up with the Joneses. Keeping up with the Joneses. They're way out ahead of you. Mom, I'll be late for school. Could I have an egg? Well, if you don't like it, you know what you can do. I'm not asking you to stick and around. I'm not sticking around because I like it here. It's just because of you and Ralph. You wouldn't know what to do without me. Want to make a bet? Mom, would you mind if I cooked myself an egg? How can you If you sit think I'm going to put up with this, you're crazy. All I hear is what you're going to do about this and what you're going to do about that. Do about that. Right. Hey, just... Of course, now, you've got to understand the parents, too. For it seems that that's where most of the trouble starts. I don't like arguments. Give me peace and quiet. Yeah, I see your point. Well, let's see here. Who else do we have? Oh, yeah, Mother Finley. Big heart for January 26th. No, 
I don't think that would work for you. You see, she devoted her life to raising foster children, and I happen to know that it wasn't all peace and quiet. But she was interested in all sorts of ways of helping people. Do you like people? Yeah, some of them. Who else do you have? Now, here's one I'll bet you never thought of. Mrs. Harry Youngman of Denver works with the blind. She transcribed letters, books, insurance manuals, and other printed material into Braille. Can you think of a better thing to do? Well, that's nice, but I'd have to go to school to learn Braille. But uh, just, I just don't well, have the that's time. That's what I thought you were going to say, uh-huh. Well, there was the story of Tom and Betty Fukuyama, who run Brotherhood House for all creeds, all races. The U.N. can't even solve that one. Why not try one big project? like Bill Wafer, whom we saluted February 23. He took it upon himself to get a memorial erected over the sunken Arizona in Pearl Harbor. It took some doing, but he got it done. Those things have all been done. Besides, I haven't the money to travel. You don't have to travel to find crippled children. You might try Sewell House or Children's Hospital, or ask Marie Wickert, who has devoted her life to crippled children. Now, what a person she is. We did her story last month on this program. We're back to kids again, huh? Yep, we're back to kids. Try as we did, we couldn't seem to stay away from the subject when we talked about big hearts. Wait now. This just may interest you. On March 16th, we told the story of Harry Flanders of Bennett, Colorado. This might be just what you want to do. What did he do? Well, among other things, he lent money to farmers during the tough years and then forgot to ask them to pay it back. You're kidding. No, I'm serious. And I can see the idea doesn't appeal to you. Mm-hmm. I know you won't be interested in the others. There was Father Jim Moynihan, as fine a man as I've ever met. He does more for underprivileged young people than any hundred people you can name. But he still needs help. I'll think about it. Well, you might think about this, too. Last week, our guest on The Biggest Heart was Judge Philip B. Gilliam of the Juvenile Court. Now, he's the man who devotes 36 hours a day toward finding a solution to one of our most frustrating problems. Juvenile delinquency. Parental delinquency is perhaps a better word. The judge told us of the child who said... Uh, a juvenile delinquent is a person who... who acts like parents. You know, there's been a lot of satisfaction in doing this series on the biggest hearts. As you've heard tonight, it takes all kinds of people doing many different things to do all the good that should be done. It has been strictly an experiment on the part of our sponsor, Fred Ward and the Hudson Dealers, and we hope and feel that it has lighted a few candles here and there. The other day, something happened that made us feel that it has been worth all the time, the trouble, and the money. I received a phone call while sitting at my desk at Fred Ward. Hello? Hello? Is this Pete Smythe in charge of Big Heart Program? Yes, that's right. My name is Bueno, uh, Lawrence Bueno. You read in papers about me, maybe. Lawrence Bueno, I see. My, my house burned down. My two little girls... Oh, yes. Uh, I did read about it. I'm sorry. Everything go wrong. I work like slave, but all time have bad luck. I think, what's the use? That's why I call you. This morning we have no food, the children hungry, everything burn up. At six o'clock a man come. He have baskets of food and blankets and clothing. And he tell us he is plumber and, and that he and, and, and others and carpenters build our house again better than before. Oh, that's wonderful. It's not much of house. Best we could find with little money. Gee, that's great. Could you give me this man's name? Finer. Al Finer. Uh, he'll restore my faith. You tell about him on the Big Heart program? Let me get it now. Al Finer. F-E-I-N-E-R. Today I know there is a Lord in heaven. Because of this man, today I, I can begin to see the sunshine again. Even though today... Today I, I go to make arrangements for funeral for... My two little girls. Better to light one candle 
than to curse the darkness. Well, that's it. Tonight, we hadn't intended to salute any special person on the program. We were just sort of winding up things. But this thing that did happen, uh, the phone call, I mean, sort of made us think that maybe we should do one last uh, stab at it to show you folks what you can do if you just have the urge. So we asked Al Finer to come down to the studio tonight, and he happens to be standing right across the microphone. Al, tell us how you're coming along out there. In first place, uh, how'd you get the idea? Well, I believe... A man that lives in a community owes something to the, his community. And you've already started going ahead with this project of yours? Most of the material is laying on the site there. And as soon as we can get the able labor, we'll have it up. Well, uh, I'd like to uh, talk to you a little more. I wish we had lots of time. But I have a few uh, things I'd like to talk to you about just briefly here as we go along. I happen to have lost my prize sheet. That's why I'm stuttering and stammering around here. Does anyone in the studio have it? I think I can remember. The first thing we always give is the scroll, which reads, The Biggest Heart, presented to Al Finer, April 13th, 1951. Great people carry big hearts. Thank you, Bill. Now I have my list, and I'll go right along. We have photographs from Clyde Jackson. He's here to record the, the show in photograph for you, and you'll get copies of it, of course. Flowers for your wife, Mrs. Finer, an orchid for her from Alpha Floral, and roses for her from Alpha Floral, 420 16th Street, the Golden Lantern. They want you to come to dinner. There's a letter from Good Hearts, and there's a letter here from Grano and Blake, and Fred Ward wants you to have this check for $25. You can use it as you like for the Bueno family. And now my personal congratulations. May there be more like you. Thank you. So, with tonight's program, we come to the end of this series of Biggest Heart Stories. We hope to be back again with you in the fall, and beginning next week at this same time, Fred Ward Incorporated and your Hudson dealers will present a new show called Mostly Music, which we hope will fit into your spring and summer plans for relaxation and leisure. And by the way, Fred Ward has asked me to thank you for your interest in the Biggest Hearts. Thanks for your letters and your phone calls. And if you have other suggestions, please continue to send them to Fred Ward in care of KLZ. And also, by the way, here's an idea from Fred Ward for your summer vacation. Take a Hudson holiday. Sunday, June 17th, the Fred Ward special leaves Denver Union Station for a chartered train trip to Detroit. Have fun on the train, music and dancing en route. Fred Ward picks up the check for your fare plus all food and tips. Take a Hudson holiday. Eight-hour layover in Chicago for a gay tour of the Windy City. Luncheon at a favorite Detroit restaurant, fun for everyone. Take a Hudson holiday. Escorted tour of the Hudson Motor Company factory where you can see those durable 1951 Hudsons made. Get factory delivery of your new 1951 Hudson. Take a Hudson holiday. Here's what you do. See and ride in the new 1951 Hudsons, the lower-priced pacemaker, the renowned Super 6, the Commodore 8, the fabulous Hudson Hornet. Select the Hudson you want. Arrangements will then be made for you to go on the Fred Ward Special to Detroit. There you will take delivery on the Hudson you ordered right from the factory. Take a Hudson holiday. Save the freight charges. Get a free trip to Detroit. Get factory delivery of a brand new 1951 Hudson. See Fred Ward Incorporated, 1300 Lincoln, or your nearest Hudson dealer. Take a Hudson holiday. Our cast tonight included Betty Trunk, Barbara Peters, Jim Herrick, John Connors, Dick Wolhoff, Will Owitz, and Jay Hanrahan. The Biggest Heart was written and produced by Pete Smythe, directed by Clayton Brace, with music by Art Gow. Sound effects by Kenny Stanger, our engineer Ralph Sargent. And now this is Bill Jones inviting you to be on hand next week at this same time for the first in a new summer series, Mostly Music, to be presented each Friday evening by Fred Ward Incorporated and your neighborhood Hudson Dealer.